When you think about the Buddha's last words, it's striking that he didn't talk about nirvana, didn't talk about emptiness, not self, dependent core rising. Any of the really famous teachings. He started with a warning. Fabrications are inconstant, arising and passing away. Achieve completion through heedfulness. In other words, he's talking about an attitude, an attitude you bring to the practice, realizing that things slip away, slip away very quickly. You've got work to do. You can't be complacent. If you let yourself be complacent, all the opportunities to improve the mind, to develop skillful qualities and abandon unskillful ones, they get lost. And you can't call them back. At the moment of death, this is probably one of the biggest regrets for a lot of people. All the good they could have done, but they didn't do. So you want to make sure you're a person with no regrets. There are two ways of doing that. One is to just be really stubborn and say, well, I don't regret anything at all, and go into huge denial. The other is to look around you, see what opportunities there are. working on the perfections, working on all the other good qualities that need to be developed. The passage where the Buddha talks about how much more merit there is in meditation than in the precepts, and how much more merit there is in the precepts than in generosity. But you can't really get anywhere without generosity or the precepts. These are necessary. These are part of the foundation. They develop the qualities you need for meditation. Generosity, realizing that to gain anything in life you have to be willing to put something out. Go out of your way. This is one of the reasons when the Buddha was talking about the very first level of right view, mundane right view. He brought up the issues of generosity and gratitude. Gratitude is when you realize other people have gone out of their way for you, and you realize what a huge change it's made in your life. And so the question is, you're just going to feed off of the generosity of others, the kindness of others, or are you going to share some food with other people so you can be a benefactor as well? It's even a place where the Buddha said you can't really attain the higher attainments if you're stingy. So it's good to think about the different opportunities you have, both outside and inside. I was reading an article in a newsletter one time. A Western monk had been in Thailand, and he'd, at the very beginning he looked around and saw all the the Thai monks and nuns puttering around here and there in the course of the day. He said, oh, these are wasting their time. They should be just doing nothing but meditating. And so that's what he tried to do. And as he focused solely on meditating, he began to find his mind is drying up. And Theravada does have that reputation for being selfish. But you look around the Theravadan countries, and there are very generous people. And so he began to realize that his preconceived notion about what the practice was had to be changed. And he found that there's kind of a juice that comes from puttering around and helping a little bit here, cleaning up there, seeing a weed here and there, just picking it as you walk past on the road, lending a helping hand when you can. It develops a quality of mind. You realize that you're not here just for yourself. And there are opportunities all around, and John Fuang used to call this the, the grass at the corral gate.
It's a time when they found some garbage that someone had left in the monastery. And then John Fung pointed it out to a visiting woman and said, Don't you see the grass at the corral gate? And she said, What do you mean? She said, Right there. Some, some very easy merit right there for the picking. And you look around, there are opportunities all the time. And you develop the quality of diligence. That's an important part of the practice. Diligence is different from heedfulness. Heedfulness is the motivating factor, the wisdom that sees. I've I don't have much time. I want to do what good I can. Diligence is when you actually carry through. Of course, we, know, we all know the dangers of allowing the daily work schedule to squeeze out your meditation. But don't let the meditation squeeze out the other good you can do as well. You want to nourish the whole mind. And part of that nourishment comes from generosity, gratitude, being very careful in your actions, and looking for all the little opportunities there are to be helpful around the place, because then you can carry those qualities into your meditation. That's an important aspect of the practice when you're trying to develop concentration and discernment is seeing the little weeds in the mind. and then uprooting them along the way. They may not be the big issues you've read about in the, in the books, but wherever there's a little bit of defilement, you want to take care of it if you can. And that quality moves deeper and deeper inside, always looking for the opportunity to make things better. To improve your mindfulness, to improve your alertness, to get quicker and quicker about noticing when the mind is about to move off into another world, catching yourself so that you don't go jumping into the balloon along with it. You can see the balloon float away, and then it'll just, it's not really a balloon, it's more like a bubble, just pop in the air. And you're not put to any trouble because it popped. You're not suddenly finding yourself dropping down to the ground, which would have been the case if you'd been in the bubble. So it's this ability to notice a lot of little things and realize that a lot of the practice is in the little things. This is an important aspect of heedfulness because you don't want to have to wait until greed, aversion, and delusion are really big. And have moved in and claimed their space in your mind before you're going to do something about them. You want to catch them when they're little, just little tiny seeds, little tiny weeds, and uproot them right then and there, like those burr plants we have around the monastery. They're a lot easier to weed in the spring. when they haven't produced their burrs. Of course, they, they have these nice little white flowers. They seem so endearing, but you can't be heedless. As the summer wears on, they turn into burrs, and you walk through them, and you've got a huge mess in your clothes, if there's any hair on your legs. It's because you were careless when things were small. So it's this willingness to look for the small things. That's going to carry you through a lot of issues. It keeps you in a proactive mode. So you're not just reacting to things as they come up, but you're actively looking for opportunities to do some good, whether it's outside or inside. And you find the opportunities exist in a lot of places where you wouldn't have expected them. Sometimes say so you get sick and you say, okay, that's it for the meditation, now while I'm sick. Well, there are actually opportunities while you're sick, little places you can look to gain a toehold at least with mindfulness and alertness. 
to take the breath that we will, we've been working with and see what it can do for the disease you have. The patterns that John Lee gives in his seven steps were actually formulated when he was recovering from a heart attack. Then you learn how he breath, <coughs> how he taught breath meditation over the years after that, and he would change his ways of describing the levels of breath in the body, the directions the breath would flow, different ways of conceiving the breath. And this came from his willingness to use the breath to deal with whatever diseases he had. And so when illness comes up, you say, okay, here's your opportunity to explore how the breath can be used when you're ill. And you learn new tricks about the breath. Areas of breath energy not only in the body but around the body that you can make use of. And John Lee talks about the, the breath as being a connector to other elements outside of the body. That's something you can explore when you're sick. You have to wait till you're sick, of course, but the opportunity is still there. In other words, if you look for opportunities, you'll find them. Even when you're dying, there are opportunities. And there are cases in the canon of people who gained awakening at the moment of death. They didn't just give up and say, well, that's it. Let themselves get sucked down the tubes, wherever the tubes are going to lead them. So here's an opportunity. Things come crowding in. Memories, regrets anticipations. And one of the lessons you should learn is that you can be proactive. You're not just a victim of whatever comes in at you. You can look for the opportunities to do something right. To remember okay, the mindfulness you developed, the alertness you developed, whatever clarity of mind you develop, you bring them to bear. This is where they really show their stuff, because everything else you've learned in life is going to leave you at that point. All the knowledge of the doctors, it's going to be useless then. The body's going. Subjects you've learned, things you've studied in school, experiences you had in this life. They may come crowding in, but they're not going to be all that helpful. The things that are going to be helpful are the good qualities you've developed in the mind, the understanding you've developed about how the mind creates states of becoming. You've got more of these balloons. Well, at that particular point, it's going to be especially serious, because you get in a particular balloon and you find yourself in a whole other body and a whole other whole birth. So you have to remember, you can choose. Some of them may seem really pressing, but you don't have to give in just because they're insistent. There's always opportunities to sidestep suffering, to sidestep unskillful mental states. It's probably one of the most important teachings that, regardless of how bad a situation may be, at least you always have the freedom to choose to do something skillful, even if it simply means abstaining from unskillful things. And even if it means you have to make a lot of sacrifices, but what you've sacrificed is not lost if it's for the sake of what's skillful. So developing this quick eye quick to see opportunities and to take advantage of them. It starts with the little things and it builds up to the big ones. That's the kind of quality you want to develop. That's the quality that counts as heedfulness and can bring the practice to completion. So be on the lookout for whatever chances you have. The 
whether it's one of the more basic qualities of the mind, some of the more, one of the more refined qualities of the mind, it's all good. And it's all part of the practice. <laughs>